Hello, everyone. This is Dong Rui Wu from the School of Artificial Intelligence and Automation, Huazhong University of Science and Technology in Wuhan, China. It's my great pleasure to give this tutorial on machine learning for accurate and secure green computer interfaces. This tutorial consists of the following parts. Uh, actually, I have a lot of materials, and we may not have enough time to cover all of them. Uh, first, uh, I will give a brief introduction to green computer interfaces, and then introduce several transfer learning approaches for accurate green computer interfaces, particularly signal processing approaches, including Euclidean alignment, for homogeneous transfer learning and the label alignment for heterogeneous transfer learning. Next, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, adversarial attacks in green computer interfaces for classification and the regression programs. Finally, conclusions and the QA. Green computer interface. Um, A uh, brain computer interface is a direct communication pathway between the brain and an external device. It can be used to research, map, assist, augment, or repair human cognitive or sensory motor functions. This uh, diagram shows a um, closed loop flowchart of a PCI system. First, we may collect um, brain signals using uh, an EEG headset or some uh, invasive sensors. And after that, we perform signal processing to increase the signal to noise ratio and also to uh, remove some off layers. And after that, we perform feature extraction to uh, reduce the dimensionality of the features and also to extract more informative features. Then we can perform pattern recognition to understand what the brain signal means. Now, based on the decoded brain signal, we can design controllers to control external devices such as a wheelchair or a game. Uh, or we can perform text input such as the, the PC handbook and SSB EP spanners. So uh, this is a closed loop PCI system. According to different types of signal sources, uh, we can partition PCI systems into three different categories. The first, uh, also the most frequently encountered type, is non-invasive PCIs. Here, we collect the brain signal from the step of the brain using an EEG headset, such as the one shown uh, on the previous page. It has the benefits of easy to wear because no surgery is needed. So it is very safe, actually no risk at all. Uh, this is its main advantage, um, but there are also several disadvantages associated, associated with this type of PCI. First, it has relatively poor spatial resolution because uh, we can not place too much electrodes um, on our scrap. Um, the frequently used number of both electrodes in the laboratory may be um, 32, 64, etc. We may also use up to 2, uh, 6, 256 or 512, 512 electrodes. But um, generally, the distance between two electrodes uh, is uh, at the scale of a uh, centimeter. So anyway, we cannot put too much electrodes on our scale. And that's what we mean by relatively poor spatial resolution. Another advantage of this non-invasive PCS is that it cannot effectively use high-frequency signals. 
the real neurons are working in um, this several cortex. Um, the um, neural activities are sent to the scalp of the of, of our brain and connected by the uh, EEG headset. Will this pass? Uh, it will need to pass through these different muscles, bones, um, etc., to reach the scalp of the brain. Uh, all these um, muscles, bones, act like low pass filters. So they will filter out the high frequency component of the neural activities. Uh, at the scalp, we can also collect some high frequency signals, but uh, most of these high, fre high frequency signals are not instead of useful uh, neural activities. So in non-invasive GCIs, usually we use a band pass filter to filter out these um, very low and very high uh, frequencies. For example, a typical um, pass band would be 4 to 30 hertz. Uh, that's what we mean by non-invasive GCIs cannot effectively use high frequency signals. Uh, the third disadvantage of non-invasive BCS is that it, uh, they require calibration prior to usage. This is uh, due to several reasons. Uh, first, individual differences, uh, because every person is different from another, so we cannot use um, a set of parameters optimized for one person or another person. Uh, another reason is that um, the EEG signals are non-stationary, so uh, a set of um, machine learning parameters uh, optimal for today's usage may not be optimal for tomorrow's usage. So we need to cal calibrate the PCI system before each usage, which is very time-consuming and user-friendly. Much of this tutorial is devoted to um, uh, how to use sophisticated machine learning algorithms to reduce this calibration effort in non-invasive PCIs. Another type of PCI system is invasive PCI. Mm, here, we collect the brain signals uh, through sensors inserted into the um, cerebral co cortex here. It can do a lot of very uh, fascinating jobs, such as repairing damaged sites or providing new functionality for paralyzed people. However, uh, its disadvantage is also obvious, and because we need to implant sensors directly into the brain matter of the brain, uh, and that means we need to perform surgery, which is risky. So um, a normal person would not like this type of BCIs. The third type of BCIs is partially invasive BCIs. Um, here, we still need to perform surgery to insert sensors inside the skull, but the sensors are uh, rested outside, outside of the brain, and they are not planted in, uh, into the cerebral cortex. So the uh, risk uh, is larger than non-invasive PCIs, but smaller than invasive PCIs. Um, actually, uh, its advantages and the disadvantages are between non-invasive PCIs and invasive PCIs. And they are not the focus of this tutorial. So uh, I will not spend too much time on that. Um, in the remaining part of the tutorial, uh, we will focus on non-invasive PCIs, or sometimes called EEG-based PCIs. Uh, actually, there are many different types of input signals in non-invasive PCIs, uh, but EEG signals are the most frequently used. Um, we mostly perform a classification for EEG-based PCIs, 
and there are three different uh, paradigms. The first is multiple imagery. Um, the imagination of the movement of various body parts results in sensory motor cortex activation, which modulates sensory motor oscillations in the EEG. Uh, we all know that our brain has two hemispheres, the left part and the right part. Uh, when we actually move our right hand or right arm, the left hemisphere of our brain will be more activated. And we can observe that from EEG signals. For a paralyzed person, uh, he may not be able to actually move his left hand or uh, right hand, left uh, hand, but uh, he can imagine that he's moving his left hand or right hand. And in this way, the corresponding hemisphere of his brain uh, is also more activated. So by measuring the um, activation level of different parts of the brain, we can know uh, what the person is imagining and we can map that imagination into commands, for example, to control wheelchair or artificial hand, etc. That, that's the basic principle of model imagery DCIs. Um, but it is easier said than done. Um, to master model imagery based DCIs, uh, we may need to treat a user for hours or days. Uh, the other two major paradigms of EEG-based BCIs are based on visual work potentials. Um, a VEP is an electrical potential recorded after a subject is presented with a visual stimulus. Uh, it has two um, subcategories. The first is a steady state VEP or SS VEP. Uh, SSVPs are potentials generated by setting the retina using video stimuli modulated at certain frequencies. Uh, for example, uh, if we want to input letters like zero, one, etc., um, to call someone, uh, we can display these 10 numbers from zero to nine on the screen and flash them at different frequencies. For example, um, number zero at 10 hertz, uh, number one at 11 hertz, etc. When the user wants to input a certain letter, he just uh, um, stares at that letter, and uh, after a very short period, for example, um, be one or two seconds, uh, the major alternation frequency of the user's EEG signal will approach the flashing frequency of that number is looking at. So by detecting the main oscillation frequency of the user's EEG signal, uh, we can know which number is looking at. Uh, that means which number we want to input and then um, output the corresponding number. Um, the principle is very simple, um, but also it has a drawback uh, because the user needs to actually looking at the number he wants to input and the number is flashing at a, uh, a certain frequency and the user can easily get fatigued. So it cannot be used for a prolonged period of time. Um, here is a demo of uh, SSVP based uh, um, car control um, from our lab. Actually, it's a very simple demo. Uh, so here, um, my students in looking at this screen, it has, has five different commands uh, flashing at different frequencies. Um, and according to the command she wants to send to the car, um, she chooses the corresponding um, uh, square and uh, looks at that square. And then we can detect uh, the uh, EEG frequency of well, uh, her, her head and then send the corresponding command to the uh, car. Um, 
so that the car can navigate through this maze. So uh, this is a very simple demo of SSVP with uh, the interfaces. The third paradigm of EEG-based BCI is the P300 event related potential or ERP. Um, a P300 ERP is a positive peak in the EEG at about 300 milliseconds after the appearance of a target stimulus. A target st stimulus means a stimulus for which the user is waiting for or thinking. And uh, once that's where stimulus happens, we may observe a P300 signal in the user's screen. And by detecting that P300 signal, we know what kind of stimulus the user just received. And then uh, we can take action accordingly. For example, based on the P300 principle, we can also design um, BCS barriers for text input. And this is a demonstration of P300 based BCS ballot, uh, ballot from uh, Whitworth Center uh, of New York. And here is the keyboard, and each row or column will flash um, randomly. The user is looking at the character he wants to input, and uh, when the row or the column containing that character is flashed, it highlights um, there will be a P300 signal in the user's screen. So we detect which row or which column it is, is the P300 signal, and then uh, we find its intersection. That would be the character the user wants to input, and then we can um, perform text input in this way. The principle is also quite simple. Of course, uh, we can also perform uh, text input using SSVP. And uh, usually, SSVP is faster than uh, the P300 based PCIs. OK, uh, we just introduced the three common paradigms of EEG based PCIs for classification programs. Um, Actually, there are also some important regression problems in EEG-based PCIs. For example, uh, from PCI, uh, from EEG signals, we can estimate the user's cognitive status or the focus level uh, or the concentration level um, or um, some behavioral statistics such as uh, reaction time, etc. Um, these are very important PCI regression problems. Uh, but in the BCI literature and the practice, people focus more on classification problems uh, and regression problems have been largely overlooked. And in this tutorial, we will consider both classification and the regression problems in EEG-based BCIs. EEG-based BCIs often rely on single trial classification or regression. The single trial means that as soon as the um, EEG pattern appears, we need to be able to detect that. However, there are several challenges for um, accurately detecting single trial EEG patterns. The first is sensor noise and degradation. This is related to uh, the hardware. Mm, uh, and is not the focus of this tutorial. But uh, the last few years have witnessed the uh, rapid the progress of EEG hardware. The other two challenges are more related to algorithms and are the focus of this tutorial. The first is intersubject differences, or also called individual differences, uh, in particularly psychology literature. It means that multi imageries or event related potentials for different subjects are different. 
this is very intuitive uh, because different people have different opinions uh, about the uh, same sound, same movie, etc. Uh, this, um, this is called individual differences. The second challenge is intro subject variations, uh, which is also called the non stationarity of the EEG signal. It means motor image rates or event related potentials for the same subject are different at different locations or time. Um, because of these challenges, particularly individual differences and the non stationary not non stationarity of EEG signals. We cannot design a DCI system with a fixed uh, classification or regression model parameters and uh, is optimal for all subjects. We need to calibrate the algorithm parameters before each usage for each new user, which is very time consuming and um, user unfriendly. Um, the goal of our research is to reduce this calibration effort to make the DCI systems more user friendly uh, and uh, preferably plug and play. For robust PCIs, we need robust features and also individualized and adaptive calibration algorithms. And uh, much of our effort was spent on individualized and adaptive calibration algorithms. We are working on a number of machine learning approaches to minimize user-specific calibration data in EEG-based PCIs. The first is transfer learning, which is a major part of this tutorial. The basic idea is to make use of data from other subjects or tasks to help the learning of the current subject or task. And we will talk more about it later. We also use deep learning which is well known to everyone, and uh, active learning, which use an uh, optimized strategy to select the best uh, enabled samples to label so that we can build a, a better machine learning model from a small number of labeled samples. We will also introduce these details in later part of the tutorial. We also make heavy use of ensemble learning um, because in um, transfer learning of BCS systems, usually we have uh, multiple auxiliary subjects or tasks, and we perform transfer learning for each such auxiliary subject or task, and then use ensemble learning to aggregate the final results. Okay, um, next. I'm going to talk about transfer learning for accurate PCIs. First, some basic definitions. In transfer learning, we have some domain and task. A domain D consists of a feature space X and is associated with the marginal probability distribution PX. That is, D equals X and is associated with PX. In transfer learning, we distinguish between a source domain and a target domain. Uh, 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 for PCA calibration, we can understand a source domain as an um, existing subject and a target domain as a, a new subject. A source domain DS and a target domain DT are different if they have different feature spaces, that is, their features are different and or they have a different marginal probability distribution of the features. That is, uh, PSX is not equal to uh, PTX. In transfer learning, we also have a, an important concept called a task. Given a domain D, a task T consists of a label space Y and a prediction function fx, that is t equal t consists of y and fx. Uh, here, um, fx, fx is equal to p y given x, and, and it is the conditional probability distribution. Two tasks t 
S and PT are different if they have different label spaces. Uh, for example, um, we uh, the two tasks classes have a different uh, are different classification programs, and or they have a different conditional probability distributions. That is, PSY given X is not equal to PTY given X. Okay, given the definition of domain and the task, next, um, we will introduce the definition of classical learning. Given a soft domain DS equal, uh, equal uh, XSI, YSI, and we have N such uh, training, labeled training samples, and a target domain DT with NL labeled samples and NU unlabeled samples. Uh, here, usually NL is much smaller than NU, or sometimes NL equals zero. That means in a target domain, we do not have any labeled samples. Transfer learning aims to learn a target prediction function F with low expected error on DT under the general assumption that XS is um, not equal to XT. That means the source and the target domains have different features, and the YS um, is not equal to YT, which means the two tasks are different, and the PSX um, is different from PTX, which means the two domains have different um, marginal probability distribution of the features, and or PSYX, and PSY given X, is not equal to PTY given X. That means the two domains have different um, uh, conditional probability distributions. The previously introduced the transfer learning is the most general concept. And in practice, we um, also consider domain adaptation, which is a simplification of general transfer learning. Domain adaptation is a special case of transfer learning, or more specifically, transductive transfer learning. Given a source domain DS and a target domain DT, domain adaptation aims to learn a target prediction function F with low expected error on DT under the assumptions that uh, XS equals XT and YS equals YT. That means the soft domain and the target domain have the same features and same classes, but the marginal probability distribution of the features are different in the two domains. And all the uh, conditional probability distribution of the labels are different in the two domains. So we can see that domain adaptation is a little bit simpler than um, general transfer learning, because here we assume the source domain and the target domain have the same features and the same classes. Um, in, uh, in this tutorial, we also distinguish between uh, heterogeneous transfer learning and the homogeneous transfer learning. Actually, uh, heterogeneous transfer learning is general transfer learning, and homogeneous transfer learning is domain adaptation we just introduced. We will use um, uh, an example in brain computer interface to uh, introduce the concept of a heterogeneous transfer learning. The goal is to use information in source domain to facilitate learning in target domain. For example, we want to use subject one's multi imagery data to help classify subject two's multi imagery data. In heterogeneous transfer learning, the feature spaces in source and attack domain should be different. For example, the two subjects could use different handsets. And even if the feature spaces are the same, the marginal probability distribution of the features in the two domains could be different. This is due to individual differences, and we cannot eliminate this difference easily. Third, 
the legal spaces in South and Texas domain could be different. For example, um, it could be two class classification for subject one, but three class classification for subject two. So these two domains have different legal spaces. And fourth, even if the legal spaces are the same, the conditional probability distribution of the labels could be different. Again, this is due to individual differences, and uh, we cannot eliminate this difference easily. We need to design a sophisticated algorithm to accommodate this challenge. For homogeneous transfer learning or uh, domain adaptation, we just introduced, we simplified the assumptions in heterogeneous transfer learning. For example, uh, the first uh, um, assumption, the feature spaces in source and target domain could be different, can be eliminated by careful experimental design. For example, we can ask the two subjects to use the same EEG headset to collect EEG signals. So the feature spaces will be the same. But the second challenge, uh, the marginal probability distribution of the features in the two domains are different, still exists, and we need to design sophisticated algorithm to accommodate this individual difference. The third challenge that the label spaces in the two domains could be different can also be removed by careful experimental design, for example, we ask the two subjects to perform the same model imagery tasks. But the fourth challenge still remains, that is the label spaces are the same, but the conditional probability distribution of labels are different. Um, recently, we have found that Transfer learning is very effective in reducing user-specific data in PCI calibration for both classification and regression problems. Um, a general um, flowchart of a closed-loop PCI system, and um, we can see uh, we propose that an explicit EEG data alignment module could be placed after temporal filtering of EEG signals, but before spatial filtering of the EEG signals to make data from the uh, source subject and target subject more consistent so that we can, um, so that after EEG data alignment, we can, we can similarly um, combine data from different subjects and then perform uh, additional signal processing and uh, feature engineering and then classification. Next, I'm going to introduce two of our recently proposed approaches for signal pre-processing pre in transfer learning for BCIs. The first is Euclidean alignment for homogeneous transfer learning. This is the procedure of Euclidean alignment, or EA. Assume a subject has n trials. First, we compute the, the arithmetic mean of all coherence matrices. Um, each trial is represented by a matrix Xi. Um, the number of those equals the number of channels or electrodes. The number of columns equals the number of samples in that trial. Here, um, Xi, Xi transpose is the um, coherence matrix of that EEG trial. Um, and in this first equation, R bar is the mean of all coherence matrix from a certain subject. And the second step is to perform the alignment of that x to the i equals r bar minus uh, to the power of minus 0.5 and then left multiply that by x i. That is, once we compute the uh, matrix r bar in the first step, we next compute its 
Um, uh, next the compute R bar to the power of minus 0.5, and then left multiply each original EG12 by this R bar um, to the power of minus 0.5 to obtain a new EG12 x to the i. In all following signal processing and machine learning uh, procedures, we will use x to the i instead of the original xi. Um, that's it. So this procedure is very simple, very easy to perform, and very efficient to perform. Why this simple procedure may work? Because after Euclidean alignment, the mean coherence matrix of all n alive EG trials becomes the identity matrix. And this is true for all subjects. That means the distribution of the coherence matrix from different subjects become more similar. And this is beneficial for transfer learning. Uh, actually, we were not the first to propose such data alignment ideas uh, in BCIs. Our Euclidean alignment idea was inspired by the remaining alignment idea proposed uh, in the literature about one year before us. The um, RA approach or remaining alignment approach performs the alignment in the remaining space instead of the Euclidean space. Um, however, we believe that our EA approach has several advantages over the RA approach. First, the remaining alignment approach needs to compute the remaining mean of the resistance state coherence matrix. Um, it has two disadvantages. Uh, first, the remaining mean does not have a closed form solution. It can only be computed iteratively, which is time consuming. And second, we need to identify the resting state um, of the EEG child. That means, in some cases, we need to know some label the data from the new subject. But for our Euclidean alignment approach, we compute the Euclidean mean of all covariance metrics. And the Euclidean mean has a closed performance solution, so it can be computed much faster. And also, because we compute the mean of all coherence metrics, uh, we do not need to know any label information. So uh, our benefit is that our EA approach is more efficient and it is completely unsupervised. Um, after the alignment, well, for the remaining alignment approach, um, it aligns the covariance, covariance matrix of the EEG trial in the remaining space. But for our Euclidean alignment approach, we align the original EEG trial in the Euclidean space. Um, here, we also have an advantage over the remaining alignment approach because um, everything in the Euclidean alignment approach is performed in the Euclidean space, and the Euclidean space algorithm can be used after EA. Um, most signal processing and machine learning algorithms we use are um, actually in the Euclidean space. So um, essentially, any algorithm can be used after EA, but we have very few of such approaches in the remaining space. Uh, no matter after RA or EA, the distributions from different subjects become more consistent. And this is uh, beneficial to um, transfer learning. Next, we perform the experiment to validate the performance of our proposed uh, Euclidean alignment approaches. We use the three publicly available datasets. Uh, the first the two are model imagery datasets. The third is event related potential. First, we use TSNE to visualize 
the effect of Euclidean alignment. Um, this plot, uh, this page shows the results on the first two subjects on a model imagery data set. Uh, let's focus on the first zone. Here we use the first subject in the model imagery data set as the target subject, and all remaining eight subjects as the source subjects. Um, the each the each 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 trail from a source subject is represented by a blue dot here, and each each trail from the target subject, uh, in this case subject one, is represented by a red dot here. We can see a lot more blue dots than the red dots because we have eight source subjects, but only one target subject. Uh, we can see from the top left uh, figure that the before Euclidean alignment, the red dots and the blue dots are quite different from each other. For example, for, for example, in this area, we have plenty of blue dots, but no red dots. But after Euclidean alignment, we, we can see that the blue dots and the red dots um, are mixed together and they have um, almost identical distribution, which is beneficial to future machine learning. In the second zone, when the second subject is used as the target subject, we can have similar observations. Okay, uh, next let's see some actual classification performance. First, uh, we perform an offline classification. The two um, bar charts shows the classification performance on the two model imagery data sets. Uh, from this table, we can observe that uh, our EA CSP LTA approach obtained the best uh, classification accuracy. Uh, if we compare this EA based approach with uh, the third column, column, which is the CSP LTA, and that means we um, simply combine data from all subjects together and then perform um, common spatial filtering for spatial filtering and then LTA for classification. The performance is not that good, but by adding a very simple EA block before CSP and LTA, we can obtain about 20% accuracy increase on the first data set and about 6% increase on the second data set. We also compared the performance of our EA-based approach with RAMTRM, which is the remaining alignment approach followed by uh, the many space class classifier. We can see that we can um, also improve, we can also obtain better performance than the remaining alignment approach. Okay, these are the classification accuracies. Um, for computational cost, uh, we can see from the um, lower table that, uh, that our algorithm can be um, computed much faster than the remaining alignment approach. In summary, of, uh, our proposed approach is both um, more accurate and uh, more efficient. Just now, we introduced the performance uh, offline classification of motor imagery data sets. Next, uh, we consider performance uh, offline classification of uh, the ERP data. Um, well, we can see that. When we add the EA block before traditional SVM classifier or external SVM class classifier, we can always improve the performance on ERP classification. Now, for online classification, we can observe similar patterns. In online classification, we um, obtain labeled um, digital files from the subject. The target subject on the fly, 
and then uh, retrain our um, transfer learning model um, after each target uh, sample arrives and then apply that model to future target samples. Uh, here in each subfigure, the horizontal axis shows the number of labeled samples from the uh, target subject and the vertical axis shows the classification accuracy. Each plot, sub plot represents uh, a different subject, and the last sub plot shows the average performance on all eight sub, on all nine subjects. Generally, we can observe that uh, our proposed EA approach, uh, which is represented by the red curve, obtained the best performance in online classification and also on the ERP data set. Okay, in summary, we consider how to cope with individual differences so that better learning performance can be obtained for a new subject with minimum or even no subject specific data. We propose Euclidean alignment to align each child from different subjects in the Euclidean space to make them more similar and hence improve learning performance for a new subject. EA has three desirable properties. First, it aligns the EEG trials directly in the Euclidean space and any signal processing, pitch extraction, and machine learning algorithms can then be applied to the aligned trials. And we have plenty of such signal processing, pitch extraction, and machine learning algorithms. Second, EA's computational cost is very low. And third, EA is unsupervised and does not need any label information from the new subject. So in summary, EA is effective, efficient, and easy to implement. And it greatly facilitates transfer learning in BCIs. We propose that EA could be an essential pre-processing step for EEG-based BCIs. Okay, uh, next, I'm going to introduce a label alignment approach for heterogeneous transfer learning, which is more complicated than homogeneous transfer learning. In heterogeneous transfer learning, we want to use information in source domain to facilitate learning in a target domain. But the source domain and the target domain could have a lot of differences. For example, their feature spaces could be different, their label spaces could be different, and their marginal and conditional probability distributions are also different. This is the most challenging uh, transfer learning scenario. Here we consider different sets of domain adaptation. In traditional domain adaptation, or um, so-called closed set domain adaptation on this page, the, um, the label spaces in the source domain and the target domain are the same. For example, in source domain, we have four classes, B, B, C, D, and in the target domain, we also have four classes, A, B, C, D. But in different set domain adaptation, we consider uh, dramatically different program. Our source domain may have four different classes, A, B, C, D, but our target domain may have four different classes, E, F, G, H. So we want to use the labeled samples for the four class, classes, A, B, C, D, to help the learning, to help class, classify um, the four different classes, E, F, G, H. This sounds counterintuitive, but it is doable through so sophisticated transfer learning. In our proposed label alignment approach for the, the aforementioned heterogeneous transfer learning, we extend ten e, uh, Euclidean alignment for homogeneous label space to heterogeneous label spaces. The main idea is to the per class grants metrics of each source subject 
to send them at the corresponding class center of the target subject. So recall that in Euclidean alignment, we align the um, overall distribution, data distribution from the source and the target subjects. Uh, but we do not distinguish between different classes. Here, we align the per class data of different subjects. If we have multiple source subjects, we can perform label alignment for each source subject separately and then use uh, ensemble learning to aggregate the final results. After label alignment, the source and the target domains have the same label set and the trails in the same class uh, aligned in the two domains. Then, trails from the two domains can be combined directly for feature extraction and the classification. Or additional domain adaptation approach can be applied after label alignment to further improve the transfer learning performance. This is the detailed procedure of our proposed label alignment approach. We assume um, this is an M class classification program. The source and the target subjects have the same number of classes, but their class labels are, are partially or completely different. The goal is to use the source data to help the classification of the target files. The procedure is like this. We first compute a transformation matrix AM for the trials of M's class from the source subject, such that the distance between the mean current matrix of the corresponding class in different domains are minimized. Um, that is, we want to compute a uh, transformation matrix, a uh, transformer matrix AM uh, that minimizes the uh, transformed, uh, minimizes the mean coherence matrix of the corresponding classes in different domains. Uh, and uh, this AM has a closed form solution, which is represented in this form. And these two C's are the uh, mean coherence matrix in different domains uh, and which can be computed easily. After obtaining this AM, we can transform each trail XJ of the source subject to this new form. That is, um, the original each trail is XJ and we left to multiply it by AM to obtain this X shoulder J. And in all following signal processing and machine learning, we will use this actual J instead of the original X, I, uh, X J. So the, procedure, the general procedure is also very simple. One small problem is how to compute this um, C bar TM, which is the uh, mean coherence matrix of the M's class in the target domain. Because uh, in target domain, we have a very small number of labeled samples. Uh, we could use uh, clustering to select the most uh, um, useful unlabeled samples to label and then to compute the um, per class mean coherence matrix. Another problem is how to match the source and the target labels. When the source and the target label sets partially overlap. For the labels in common, we match each source label with the same tag label, and then randomly match each remaining source label with a remaining tag label. For example, if the source label set is ABC and the tag label set is ADE, then we match the source label A with tag label A, source label B with tag label D, and source label C with technical label E. Of course, we can also switch the mapping of both BC and DE. Um, this will not affect the final transfer learning performance much. If the source and the technical label sets are completely different, 
we can randomly match the source and time labels. Next, I'm going to introduce some experimental results to demonstrate the performance of our proposed label alignment approach. We used the two publicly available multi imager datasets, uh, which have been used before in our EA experiments. Again, here is a visualization of uh, one of the datasets before and after EA, and also before and after LA, so that we can compare the difference between EA and LA. In the first zone, we use subject one as the source, uh, uh, as the target subject, and the subject two to nine as the source subject. Um, we use different colors to represent different uh, classes for each subject. Um, these green and the blue dots are from the eight source subject, and the black and the purple dots are from the text subject. Uh, we can see that before alignment, the uh, data from the text subject is, um, is separated from those from the source subjects. So if we blindly combine the data from different subjects um, and then perform classification, the classification performance may not be good because they have so much difference. Um, in the middle plot here, we perform Euclidean alignment. And we can see that after alignment, the data from different subjects are mixed together, but also data from different classes are also mixed together. So um, this is better than not performing any alignment, but may not be optimal for classification because different classes are mixed together. Um, in the third plot, we show the results after label alignment. Uh, we can see that um, the same class in the source domains, for example, the blue dots are mixed together, and also the green dots are mixed together. And um, the two classes in the target domain, the black dots and the purple dots, um, are also quite separated. Um, here, if we perform classification by a simple classifier, like in this way, uh, we can easily separate two classes. That means label alignment may be more advantageous to Euclidean alignment in terms of classification. But label alignment needs some labeled sample from target domain, while Euclidean alignment does not need any such labeled sample. So they have different application scenarios. And for subject two, we have similar observations. In our classification experiments, we consider the three scenarios and two questions. The first scenario is that the source and the target subjects have the same feature space and partially overlapping label spaces. And this is multi-class classification. The second scenario is that the source and the target subject have the same feature space and the completely different label spaces. Here we can see the binary classification. The third scenario is that the source and the target subjects have different feature spaces and also different label spaces. That is, um, both the feature spaces and the label spaces are different. And this is the most uh, complicated uh, for learning scenario. For each scenario, we try to answer two questions. First, can label alignment be used as an effective pre-processing step before different feature extraction and classification algorithms? Second, can label alignment be integrated with other domain adaptation approaches to further improve the classification performance? Uh, of course, um, the answer to both questions are yes. 
but demonstrated in our later experiments. Um, we have a lot of experimental results, but uh, due to time limit, uh, I'm not going to um, detail of for every page. Um, but let's um, focus on scenario one, question one. We have we have same feature space, but partially overlapping label spaces. We compare the over label alignment approach with Euclidean alignment approach and approach that uh, does not use any alignment at all. The two red curves are the label alignment approaches, and um, they represent different uh, um, signal processing and uh, classification algorithms. But generally, we can observe that the two red curves are higher than um, curves of other colors, which means that um, label alignment approach can achieve better performance than Euclidean alignment and no alignment. In other scenarios, we have similar observations. So, in summary, domain adaptation can reduce the BCI calibration effort. Most domain adaptation approaches require the source domain to have the same feature space and the label space as the target domain. Here, we consider the different set domain adaptation for BCS, that is, the source and the target domains have different label spaces. We propose the label alignment to align the source label space with the target label space. Uh, it has three main characteristics. First, LA only needs a field of one labeled sample from each class of the target uh, sub subject. And the second, LA can be used as a pre-processing step before different feature extraction and uh, classification algorithm. And third, LA can be integrated with other transfer learning approaches to achieve even better performance. In summary, we consider the, the most challenging heterogeneous domain adaptation so far, simultaneous, uh, simultaneous cross subject, cross headset, and cross class transfer. Um, actually, this tutorial also includes several other transfer learning approaches for classification and regression, uh, but due to time limits, uh, I'm not going to introduce them. Uh, at the end of the tutorial, we have a list of references. Um, from there, you can find all these different approaches. Um, next, I'm going to uh, use about one hour to introduce adversarial attacks in BCS, which is related to the safety of BCS systems. And this is a very novel research direction. First, let me introduce the basic concepts of adversarial attacks. In an adversarial attack, deliberately designed small perturbations, which may be hard to notice even by human, are added to normal samples before a machine learning model and cause dramatic performance degradation. This phenomenon was first discovered in image classification by Ian Goodfellow and his colleagues. For example, in this classical example, um, the left picture is classified as a panther by a deep learning classifier. But after adding some small, deliberately designed uh, perturbations, as shown in the middle part of the figure, uh, to this panther uh, picture, uh, we obtain a new picture shown in, um, on the right-hand side of the equation. For human eyes, these two pictures look almost identical, and we can um, see with confidence that the right-hand side picture is also a panda. But the um, deep learning classifier would classify the right-hand side figure as um, people with very high confidence 
instead of a pander. That is, by adding a very small perturbation to the original image, we can fool the uh, deep learning classifier to make mistakes. This is very dangerous in um, certain applications like medical diagnostics, autonomous driving, etc. In our research, we try to answer this question. Do we have a similar phenomena in EEG-based PCIs? That is, can we add a small perturbation to um, a benign EEG epoch so that the same classifier would have um, misclassification of the um, perturbed EEG trial? The answer was yes. According to how much the model, we can have different types of classifications, uh, different types of reversible uh, attacks. The easiest is white box attacks. Here, the attacker has access to all information of the target model, including its architecture and the parameters. So this is the easiest scenario. And also, we may have a black box attacks. Here, the attacker knows nothing about the target model, but can observe its responses to inputs. This may be corresponding to the scenario that the attacker wants to attack a commercial EEG-based PCI system. He can buy such a system and um, observe its responses to inputs and then perform uh, attacks. But he does not know anything about the um, classification model used in that PCI system. Um, this is the flowchart of a PCI system. We propose that to perform adversarial attacks, we can add a jamming module between signal process, pre-processing and the feature extraction. The Jamie module will inject adversarial uh, perturbations uh, into the normal EEG trial. And an uh, adversarial perturbation should be first small, so that it is hard to be detectable, and second, effective, so that it can fool the machine learning model. Um, potential application of adversarial attacks including, for example, uh, PCI-controlled wheelchair or actual skeletons. Uh, if, we attack, if we attack such uh, devices, the user may get confused or frustrated. Uh, this will significantly reduce the user's quality of life or even hurt the user by driving the user into danger on purpose. Another potential application is to uh, mislead uh, clinical diagnostics. For example, uh, for awareness evaluation or detection for disorder of conscious patients. Next, I'm going to introduce several adversarial attacks approaches in classification problems in EEG-based PCIs. Uh, each EEG trial is represented by a matrix Xi in this way. Here, we have C uh, loads, each corresponding to uh, an electrode, and the T columns, each corresponding to um, a time domain sample. Um, we want to add a jamming module G between signal processing and the machine learning to fool the classifier. Um, the the jamming module G will introduce a perturbation to the um, EEG trial to G 
changed original trial xi to uh, x tilde i. G needs to sanctify two requirements. First, it is represented by this equation uh, on this inequality. It means that the perturbation should be very small so that it cannot be detected easily. And second, f tilde xi is not equal to yi. It means that after introducing the perturbation, the classification results uh, would be different from the ground truth. It means that the perturbation is effective. Um, next, I'm going to introduce uh, an unsupervised FGSM approach for such attacks. First, um, um, let's introduce the F, uh, FGSM approach proposed by Ian Goodfellow uh, for adversarial attacks for images. This idea is very simple. It finds an optimal max norm perturbation zeta constrained, on, constrained by epsilon to maximize um, the, the loss function in training the class, classifier. Uh, this zeta is computed in this way. Um, here, this part is the uh, first order gradient um, with respect to xi. This uh, epsilon constrains the magnitude of the perturbation. After obtaining this data, the GME model G and becomes this. It simply adds this data to the original line E each trial xi. Um, we proposed an unsupervised FGSM approach for white box attacks based on the previously introduced FGSM approach. Um, in white box attacks, the attacker knows the architecture and the parameters of the target model. And its application, it has several applications. For example, a BCI designer evaluates the worst case performance of the system and the attack. In this case, um, the BCI designer knows everything about the target model. A second application scenario is that the target model of a BCI system is somehow leaked or hacked so that the attacker knows everything of the target model. The original FGSM approach needs to know the true label yi of xi. In our unsupervised FGSM, we do not know the true label yi, but we can replace the true label yi by y prime i, which is the um, prediction of which is the uh, predicted label from a classifier chain uh, from the source domain. And then we just uh, replace the ground truth label yi in the um, original FGSM approach with this pseudo label. And intuitively, estimation is accurate, then this approach would work well. Um, but surprisingly, in our experiments, we found that. UFGSM is still effective even when Y prime I is quite different from Y I. So this is the pseudo code of our proposed UFGSM approach, which is very simple. We also consider the black box attacks here. The attacker knows the architect uh, in White box attack, the attacker knows the architecture and the parameters of the target model. But in a black box attack, the attacker can only send input to the target model and observe its output. 
its application scenario is to attack a commercial preparatory EEG based PCR system. We make use of the transferability of adversarial examples, which means that adversarial examples generated by one deep learning model can also with high probability for another model, even the two models are different. Our, uh, in our proposed unsupervised FDSM for black box uh, attacks, we synthesized some inputs to the target model, record the output tree. In this way, we can obtain an input output training data set for the target model. Then we train a substitute model and use previously introduced UFGSM to generate adversarial examples for this substitute model. Because this substitute model is um, a model we we train from the input output pairs, we know everything about it. So this part is a white box attack. After that, based on the principle of uh, transferability, the generated adversarial examples can also be used to attack the original text model. So this is the pseudocode of our proposed UFGSM for black box attacks. It's a little bit more complicated than white box attacks, but still achievable. Next, we perform experiments um, on three datasets to validate the performance of our proposed approach. Um, the first is a P300 evolved potential dataset. The, the second is feedback error related to negativity dataset. And the third is model imagery. We use the three different um, Deep learning, we attacked the three different deep learning models in our experiments. The first is EEGNet, which is a com compact single model with about 1,000 parameters. The second is DeepCNN, which is a little bit deeper than EEGNet, but it still has only five layers. The third is ShallowCNN, which has only three layers. We use the two performance measures in our experiments. The first is the raw classification accuracy, uh, which is the uh, ordinary classification accuracy used in many classification programs. The second is balanced classification accuracy, which is, is the classification accuracy on class one, uh, which is the average classification accuracy for different classes. Sometimes the BCA is more meaningful than RCA because um, some of our data sets are highly imbalanced. For example, um, for this um, P300 um, evolved potential data sets, we have um, positive to negative ratio at about 7 to 1 or 8 to 1. So the Raw classification accuracy may not be a very good measure. We need to use balanced classification accuracy. We also consider the two scenarios in our experiments. The first is within subject experiment. The second is cross subject experiment. In within subject experiments, we use 80% data for training and 21% present for test. And uh, all these data are from the same subject. Same subject. In cross-subject experiment, we perform the D1 subject of cross-validation. Um, for example, if we have eight subjects, we, uh, we could reserve the eight subject as the test subject and use the uh, first uh, seven subjects to train a model. Um, for the B 
baseline performance, uh, we can observe that for every algorithm and every data set, cross subject classification performance was always smaller than within subject classification performance due to individual differences. This is very intuitive. In white box attacks, uh, we can see that at the Ipsen, which is the maximum perturbation magnitude increases, the PCI decreases rapidly. For example, in the top left figure, uh, which shows the uh, attack performance on the P300 data set, um, we can see that uh, when Ipsen becomes 0.05, the PCI reduces from 0.8 to about uh, 0.3. And this, we call that this is a two class classification. So, a uh, classification accuracy of 0.3 means uh, the classification performance is worse than random gas. So, the PCI system would be completely unusable. For the ERN and the MI data set, we can observe similar phenomena. The bottom right figure shows the adversarial examples and the original examples. Uh, we can see that uh, the red curve shows the adversarial example and the green curve shows the original example. We can barely see the red curve. It means that the Perturbation is very small, B of zero. Um, okay, just now we show the white box attack performance. This page shows black box attack performance. Um, we can see that for the baseline performance, uh, we have quite high classification accuracy, but after black box attack, uh, the classification accuracy was dramatically decreased. Also, we uh, checked if adding random noise could uh, degrade, uh, degrade the classification performance. If so, we do not need to um, design the um, black box adversarial uh, perturbations, we just add random noise, that's enough. But from the experimental results, we can see that random noise uh, does not have significant effect on the classification performance. That means we still need to use sophisticated approaches to design the perturbations. Um, finally, uh, I will introduce another approach that integrates active learning and uh, the just the proposed UFGSM for better um, black box attack performance. Our previous black box attack approaches has three steps. First, it queries the target model to obtain some input output pairs. And the second, it trains a substitute model. Third, it uses UFTFM to generate adversarial real examples. Here, the question we want to consider is how to reduce the number of queries. We make use the idea of active learning. Um, first, uh, let me briefly introduce the, active, the idea of active learning, which optimally selects offline and labeled samples for labeling. Assume that we have two classes, A and B. A is surrounded by class B, uh, but we do not know this ground truth uh, distribution. What we have are some um, samples from the two distributions. Most of the samples, which are shown in green, are unlabeled. And for each class, we have only two labeled samples. Based on these samples, we can train a classifier 
um, to classify these two classes, such as this um, black dashed line here. Clearly, this classifier is quite different from the two um, classifier, which should be the uh, green, uh, green circle in this figure. Yeah. So uh, if we have a chance to add another two um, labels to these samples, which two samples should we select to label so that we can achieve the uh, better learning performance? The simplest approach is random selection. That is, we randomly select two unlabeled samples to label and then retrain the classifier. But this may not be the optimal approach since, uh, for example, in this figure, if we select this sample to label and this sample to label, uh, we can obtain the ground truth class uh, labels. But these two samples are so far away from the um, decision boundary, they do not change the decision boundary at all. So we waste. Uh, two chances of um, label, labels. In contrast, we can use active learning to better select the unlabeled samples to label so that we can obtain better learning performance. There are many different active learning approaches. The simplest is to select the, sample, the samples with the maximum uncertainty to label. For example, uh, in this case, we select the samples closest to the current decision boundary label. In this figure, uh, this one and this one are the closest to the current decision boundary. Mm. So we select them and label them as class B. After that, we update our classification model and the decision boundary may become this this uh, red dashed curve, which is closer to the green circle. We can imagine that uh, we can iterate this process a few times, and eventually our decision boundary will approach the true decision boundary. This is the idea of active learning. There is another um, actually active learning approach called the query synthesis. Um, it assumes that we can query any sample in the input space, including synthesis the ones. Um, so uh, we can use active learning strategy to uh, synthesize some inputs and ask the user to label them. Uh, once we add these labeled samples to our training set, we can dramatically increase the learning performance. But this approach is not popular in traditional classification tasks because the synthesis, the sample may be hardly recognizable by a human label. Um, because the algorithm thinks that if one can label such sample, uh, its performance can be greatly improved. But the synthesis, the ones may not be meaningful to human label, so we cannot label them. However, this approach is very suitable for query generation in constructing the substitute, um, the substitute model in black box attacks. Because here, we use the tagged label, uh, tagged model to label the samples. It can label the sample with any shape, um, no problem at all. So uh, in this work, we propose a query synthesis based active learning approach to generate the synthetic EEG samples. Um, I'm not going to introduce the details of this approach. Uh, it can be found in our paper. And this page shows the performance of this, uh, our proposed deep, uh, active learning based uh, attack approach. Uh, in comparison with the traditional uh, approach, that is um, the approach proposed in our previous paper. Um, here, 
these um, bot numbers mean better performance. We can observe that our proposed query synthesis based active learning almost always achieved a better black box attack performance than the traditional Jacobian based approach given the same number of queries. We can also visualize the perturbations. Again, they are very difficult to visualize in both the time domain and um, time frequency domain. And in our following work, we also consider the uh, causal attacks, and uh, uh, this is a little bit more complicated. Um, the, um, that's just uh, um, that's only introduced the conclusion about the coral attack part. One can generate adversarial EEG perturbation templates for target attacks for both P300 and SSV P spellers. That is, um, deliberately designed PNE perturbations can manipulate an EEG based PCS spellers to output anything the attacker wants with high success rate demonstrating the vulnerability of BCS failures. And our proposed attack framework is not specific to the victim models. They can also be utilized to attack many other classifiers in BCS with little modification. In our later work, we also performed a virtual real attacks to uh, regression programs in EEG-based BCS and achieved a very good performance. For example, um, in this paper, we show the attack performance to EEG-based driver jolliness estimation and um, achieved a uh, very good attack performance. Um, okay, and these are the references for our transfer learning um, work and uh, from the Mm -hmm. On our website, mm, we also list uh, other references for the transfer uh, for adversarial attacks in BCS. Uh, and uh, we also open source most of our code on GitHub. Uh, please feel free to use them. And if you have any comments, you can always um, contact us. Um, okay. Uh, we have a few um, audience. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, anyone had any questions. I will be very happy to answer the questions. Um, the main content of my tutorial um, has just been finished, and we can have some time for discussion uh, if you want. Um, you can either send me uh, questions or comments by chat or uh, unmute yourself. Okay, um, I guess we do not have uh, any question here. And uh, um, that's all for my tutorial. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I will stop sharing, and uh, that's the end of this.